Hi, my name is Lauren Chatwick and I'm the Regional Youth Vice President. I'd like to welcome you to the 7th Episcopal District's Youth Good Friday service. Tonight you will hear from all the youth from across the district. I would like to thank Bishop James E. Walker and Reverend C.C. for this opportunity. I'd like to recognize my elder, Reverend Kevin Jerome A.G. and my church family from St. John Simi Church, where our pastor is Reverend Marcus J. Rogers. I also like to recognize the director of the CYF at St. John Simi Church, Sister Cherie Hembry. At this time, I'd like to introduce my angel Fuller from Cleves Memorial Simi Church in, Colum in Columbia, South Carolina to lead us in prayer. Bow your head. Oh, Holy Lord, you are worthy of all our praises. Heavenly Father, our provider, our maker, and our protector. Our Father and God, we bless your name forever. Father in heaven, King of glory, we adore your name and work to glorify your name forever. Heavenly Lord, your name is glorious and wonderful. We praise you in every way. Amen. Thank you, my angel, for that beautiful prayer. Now we will have Summer Edmund from Sydney Park CME Church in Columbia, South Carolina, give an overview of the seven things found at the cross. Hello, and welcome to the 7th Episcopal District Youth Good Friday service. I'm Summer Edmund of Evergreen CME Church in Star, South Carolina. The Youth Good Friday program is based on the seventh last words. The theme for our program is seven things I found at the cross. The seven last words are actually phrases that Jesus spoke on the cross. These last words provide a window into Jesus' soul. These words reveal his forgiveness, his incredible love, his determination, his humanness, his divinity, his intimate relationship with the Father, and finally, his trust. The presenters in their own words will focus on what Jesus gave to us through his life. They will help us understand what's so important to Jesus as he died for our sins and gave up his life, that we might have everlasting life. We hope you enjoy our program and that it ministers to yourself. That was a wonderful overview, Summer. Now we will hear from Minister Lamar Johnson from Christ Seamy Church in Waterbury, Connecticut, about the greatest forgiveness. Praise the Lord, Saints. My name is Lamar Johnson from Christ CME in Waterbury, Connecticut, where Reverend Shanita Thompson is the wonderful pastor. First, giving honor to God, who is the head of my life. Now, may we bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Father, I thank you for what you've done on Calvary Cross. And I ask as I speak this word, your people will apply it through their daily life. Amen. My scripture for this particular day will be from Luke, the 23rd chapter, and verse 43, from the New King James Version. Then it reads, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The topic I was given is the greatest of forgiveness. First, I would like to start off by giving you a thought. Have you ever done something unlike Jesus, stealing or harming? And then after that, you realize or know it was wrong. So you go to God and ask for his forgiveness. Jesus' time directed to a sinner. This biblical expression is found only in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus shows his divinity by opening heaven for a repentant, a repentant sinner. Such generosity to a man that only acts to be remembered. Amen. This expression offers us hope for salvation. For if we turn our hearts and our prayers to him and accept his forgiveness, we will be with Jesus Christ at the end of our lives. On the cross, there was a man known for his criminal actions, such as stealing. At first he joined with the other Jews and said, aren't you the savior? Save yourself. After all, the whole world it seemed had went against Jesus. He who proclaimed to be the savior of the world hardly seemed to be the savior of anything in present circumstances to them. 
But then by a miracle of God's grace, the thief's mind and heart was changed. And he realized that the man being crucified next to him was none other than Lord of glory. The other man knew that he was going to die for wrongdoing. So he turned and looked at Jesus and said, Will you remember me when you walk into your kingdom in heaven? And Jesus replies with an acceptable answer, Yes, you will be with me in paradise. Then speaking up for Jesus, explaining the true criminals are receiving their justice, then saying this man has done nothing wrong. We should be more like Jesus, amen? Forgiving people that you know ain't right or even did wrong to you? I would like to take a quick second and be honest with you. I would not try to remember someone that's done wrong to me. But God replied saying yes, I will remember you when you walk into the kingdom of heaven. And today I would like to submit to you that God is a forgiving God when we repent. No matter what I do, God keeps his promise and he stands on his word and crosses the sins I have committed out of my record book. Oh, what a God we serve. We should fast and pray. Give all the attention to God because God is a forgive, is a dependable God. And no matter what it looks like in the midst, God is able to change things around. No matter what's happening with the pandemic or COVID-19, God is able to turn things around. God is able, and he has the whole world in the mighty big palm of his hands. And I don't know about you, but I walk and I talk with a God that sends miracles. And Jesus died upon the cross to redeem mankind, to save us from all of our sins because of his love for us. And he said his word, that he will be back again. And I say unto you that he will be back again. God bless and stay healthy. Thank you, Minister Johnson, for letting us know we can find forgiveness at the cross. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Phoenix Pace, who is the Carolina Region Youth Assistant Secretary and is from Young's Missionary Temple, CME Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, who will speak on The Greatest Faith. Good evening. I'm Phoenix Pace. I attend Young Missionary Temple, where my pastor is Ronald L. White, and I'm a part of the 7th Episcopal District. I was given greatest faith. The scripture I was given is Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and it says, Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be in paradise with me. In this text, Jesus is making a promise to one of the men he's crucified with to enter paradise with him. This man who has committed sins willingly confessed his misdoings. This man gave forth his best version of faith. He told Jesus, we deserve this, you do not. This criminal casted his faith into Jesus. He casted his faith into the Jesus no one believed in, to the Jesus people believed that was a failure. Could you cast your, your faith in that Jesus? Or would you fall into the beliefs of everyone else? Which brings me to ask, how do you establish where to cast your faith? Do you look for multiple people? Do you look for success? Do you look for failure? How can you possibly determine where to cast your deepest beliefs? Well, this man did. He put the little faith that he had in Jesus. Would you be able to do that? He had nothing left, but yet he casted away his fears and took a great leap of faith. This man, he was promised this place called paradise. Well, when researching the word paradise, when I looked in the Bible, it was found that it was mentioned three times in the New Testament. And each time it was mentioned, it was mentioned with some type of mention of God, which means paradise has to be a synonym of heaven. Well, when I kept researching and I kept looking for a bigger meaning, I asked a variety of people what they took on the spiritual sense of paradise. And I got a variety of answers from a buffet cruise in heaven. I got spiritual and mental reliefs. I got streets of gold. Isn't that nice to think of? Just a place of freedom? 
of spiritual freedom, pure freedom that comes with no cost other than serving your God. When I thought of the word paradise, I thought of this, this place where I was spiritually free, spiritually allowed to be broken or made whole, a place of comfort, a place of love. But yet, the biggest thing we have to ask ourselves is how far are we willing to go on our faith? How far are you willing to go? How crazy are you willing to look? This man sat here on the cross, basically on his deathbed, ready to give his life away, and told Jesus, I believe. He put his best version of faith. We all have our own type of faith. And so the question I ask you today to ask yourself is, how can I turn my greatest fear into my greatest faith? How can I establish a faith so strong that it won't weary on the weakness of others? How can I create my greatest faith? And how can I share my greatest faith? How can I show my greatest faith? Thank you. Thank you, Phoenix, for challenging us to cast our greatest faith in Jesus. Now, Anthony Smoke from St. Paul Simi Church in Egg Harbor, New Jersey, will speak on the greatest family. Greatest family. What is a family? A family is commonly known as a group of people living together in a house. In the Bible, the concept of family is very important, both in a physical and theological sense. There are many families that are mentioned throughout this Bible. Some have a good relationship, while others not so good. If you think about the Bible as a whole, it all focuses around the greatest family, also known as the spiritual family. In Luke 23, verses 42 through 43, Jesus is talking to one of the criminals that was to be led out with him. The criminal asked Jesus to remember him when he goes into his kingdom. Jesus replies, what I am about to tell you is true. Today you will be with me in paradise. The question is, why did Jesus say this? Well, when the criminal asked Jesus to remember him, he was really asking him to forgive him for his sins. He was giving his life to Christ. Jesus accepts his request and tells him that he will be joining him in paradise. The criminal has just joined the spiritual family. The greatest family must have some sort of connection, right? This connection has to be strong. Praying is one way to strengthen it. Praising him is another. There are countless ways to do it. All over the Bible, the greatest family keeps its connection strong. There is one family out of many mentioned that doesn't have a good connection though, Cain and Abel. Cain became jealous of his brother when the Lord was pleased with Abel and not him, so he killed him. This is not an example of a spiritual family, but a family of ungodly values. This earthly family is a complete opposite of what God wants us to live our life, lives like. The spiritual family is a system that, containing brothers, sisters, mothers, and fathers. In this family, the members do not harm each other. Instead, they look after one another and encourage us to stay faithful to the Lord, even through rough times. Spiritual family. The definition of this family is different from the one of a regular family. Though, what comes to mind when you hear the word spiritual family? Do you think of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost? Back to what Jesus said on the cross. If we confess to him that he is faithful and to forget and forgive us for our sins, then we can be welcomed into the greatest family of all. This will help us believe that one day we will be we will have eternal life with our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Anthony, for reminding us how important family is. Next up, we will have Morgan Knox from Parkwood Institutional Seamy Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, on greatest fear being forsaken by God. My name is Morgan Knox. I'm 11 years old, and I have a twin sister. And I have a twin sister named Skylar. Hello. 
I attend Parkwood CMA Church. I'm part of a youth ministry. My pastor's name is Reverend Dr. Kathy C. Jones, and my presiding elder is Clifton Harris Sr. And today I will be talking to you about fear. Fear is big. This is my last year of elementary school, and I've been here since sick. I've been here since kindergarten. I've been here for like six years. So going to middle school is gonna be different for me. Like I don't know what the outcome is gonna. I don't know what is gonna happen. I don't know nothing. So it's that scary. I have no idea what the future is gonna hold for me. I have to make new friends. I have to be in a new environment. Everything is gonna be new to me, and that's scary. Therefore, I can imagine how the disciples felt when Jesus died. Their king, their protector. They probably felt sad because without him, they don't feel safe. So that must have been scary also. Like it says in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, So do not fear, I am with you, God. I will strengthen you, help you, and uphold you. With my righteous right hand. Also, Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 tells us that God didn't give us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. God has given us the tools we need to be fearless. So let's build on that and be fearless. Thank you, Morgan, for sharing how we could be fearless, even in the midst of our biggest fear. Now we will have a liturgical dance to break every chain by Tasha Coughlinger. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain Woo! To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain There is power Come on. You declare it. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. There is power in the name. In the name of Jesus. We know where it is to break every break every chain. Break every chain. Come on, say to break every break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army.
was a beautiful moving dance. Now Denny McGee II from Lane Memorial CME Church in Washington, D.C. will speak on the greatest fountain. Good evening. My name is Daniel Miggy II, and I bring you greetings from the church where everybody from everywhere is somebody in Jesus Christ. Lane Memorial CME Church, where Reverend Paul D. Everett is pastor and where I serve as a junior steward and a member of the usher board. I also bring greetings from my parents, Daniel and Satora McGee, along with my siblings, Camille and Bryce Dwight. I would like to thank my presiding elder, Elder Kevin Agee, for the opportunity to participate in this forum. And I would also like to acknowledge my bishop, Bishop James B. Walker of the 7th Episcopal District. In continuing with our conversation on the things found at Calvary, I want to focus on the Great Fountain. The discussion of the Great Fountain, an adjacent construct to the more typical Seven Last Words content, around Jesus' announcement in John 19, verses 28 through 30, I thirst, looks more at the irony of Jesus claiming the need for water when he is the living water. Revelation 7, verse 17. Understanding that the living water is Jesus and that we drink of those waters by believing in Christ and living christ in our lives, I want to focus on the feeling of your thirst being quenched. Have you ever played a sport? I remember last football season when I was doing conditioning day, which is where you just run around and work off all the stuff from spring and winter. As practice let on, I got really thirsty. Coach said there would be no water until the end of practice. And so as practice went on, I got really thirsty. My mouth, and by the end of practice, my mouth was extremely dry. And once I drank the water, I felt refreshed and renewed. I drank and was satisfied. Just as water quenches carnal thirst, being saved spiritually quenched is the sweetest feeling as we Christians can ever feel. To know that we are sheltered in the palm of God's hands, protected and provided for from now to forever is the ultimate satisfaction for people of God. In closing, I'm reminded of John 7, verse 37, which reads, On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. At Calvary, I found the greatest fountain. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Daniel, for reminding us we don't have to be thirsty because Jesus is the living water. Now we will have Minister Khalil Robertson from Williams Memorial CME Church in High Point, North Carolina, talk about the greatest finish. Hello, my name is Minister Khalil Robertson, and today I will be talking about the great finish. And that scripture comes from John chapter 19, verse 30. And it says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Then bowed his head down, and gave up his spirit. Now, before we talk about the great finish, I want to talk about, you know, the exclamation points in Jesus' life with the start and everything. So we know that Jesus, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed 5,000 people. He uh, casted out demons. He did a lot, of, a lot of miraculous things for his society. And so, and what that really, that really did a lot for Jesus because that's what he came on earth to do. And so, when we take it into today's time, many of us have good starts on our job, and we have good starts in school. We might be getting ready to graduate. We have good grades. We're passing exams. We're moving on into uh, the next grade, and, and, and we have a lot of good starts with our health and strength. We have good starts with our family and friends in terms of relationships and building relationships, and so those are really good starts that helps us achieve our goal. And so, I want you to realize that next, while Jesus is on the cross, the scripture says he received a drink. Now, that drink is called Pascha, and really, that is, the main thing that is filled with that is vinegar. And so, when we think of vinegar, we think of this bitterness taste, this distasteful taste. It's really not good, something that we don't like. 
And we don't want to have. And so realize that Jesus was already on the cross. And he realized his job is coming to an end. But yet he had to taste that bitterness. And so when we're on our journey in our Christian life and on our uh, daily life, we can sometimes have a bitterness, a vinegar type of situation in our lives. And what that does for us, that causes discouragement. But the thing I want you to realize is that in the scripture, it says that Jesus said it is finished and then bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So I want you to realize that Jesus didn't give up his spirit before he said it is finished. All right. And so what I'm trying to tell you, so if Jesus was on the cross and he was all beaten all day, he got nails in his hands and nails in his feet, he got a thorns he got a crown of thorns on his head and yet he didn't give up his spirit until he knew the job was done i want you to i want you don't give up don't give up i want you to understand that everything is going to be all right because jesus paid it all that was his finish his finish was so that we can live today's life don't quit i know it may seem hard but keep the faith Keep on praying because he did not bring you this far just to leave you. God still cares for you. He still cares for you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. God has great things ahead on you. Just keep pushing. You have nothing but blessings ahead. You just got to keep on pushing. Keep on pushing because Jesus, he paid it all. He paid it all. He paid it all so that we can have a great life. He wants the best for you. And so I declare in the name of Jesus that whatever you're going through right now, whatever the situation is, that you will make it because Jesus paid it all. And that was his great finish. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Robertson, for reminding us to never give up and to finish well. Now we will have not only my cousin, but the New York, Washington region youth president, Ashley Brown from St. John CME Church in Washington, D.C. on The Greatest Future. Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Brown and I am a member at St. John CME Church in Washington, D.C. and I am also the youth president for the New York, Washington region. So today I have the honor of speaking on the seventh thing found at the cross, the last thing, the seventh last word. And that directly corresponds with Luke chapter 23, verse 46, which reads, Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Now, after we have gone through the greatest forgiveness, greatest faith, family, fear, greatest fountain, greatest finish, at this point, Jesus is ready to commit his life to the Lord and to trust him and commit and trust his everlasting existence in the hands of the Lord. So what this means for us is that in order to expect our greatest future, to expect our everlasting lives, we first have to be able to trust and commit to the Lord, or we cannot expect that to happen. And it is, it is okay to have doubts when it comes to this and not be sure or make mistakes along the way, because Jesus did too. We learned earlier that he did not want to die on the cross for our sins. He did not want to have to go through this. And Inevitably, after going through a lot of things, his um, forgiveness, faith, family, or going through all those things, he realized that it was time to trust in the Lord or he could not expect the greatest future. So not only do you have to trust in the Lord to expect your greatest future, you must acknowledge your wrongdoing. And while reading this chapter, Luke 23, I realized this when Jesus was between two other criminals, very different. One was expecting Jesus to just save him, save himself and everything, and not acknowledging his wrongdoing, not trusting the Lord or anything like that. But the other one, he admitted what he was doing wrong. He said that um, we deserve to die for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. So after he said that, Jesus said that, I assure you today, you will be with me in paradise. So that goes to show that in order to expect to be in paradise, to expect our everlasting life, to expect our greatest future that we need to be able to acknowledge and we need to be able to trust. This text must not only be interpreted as how we must gain our greatest future, but as the greatest future that Jesus guaranteed for us when he died on the cross for our sins. 
he was an innocent man, innocent of all charges being placed against him. And this wasn't realized until after the entire course of events happened. So he was able to put all of that trust in the Lord and for our sins. And we must be able to do the same. We must be able to trust in the Lord to follow in Jesus' footsteps, to be able to expect certain things to happen to us, to expect eternal life and to expect for God's forgiveness. Overall, what I take from this seventh thing found at the cross is that trust and acknowledgement and commitment is a big part of guaranteeing our future. And it was a big part of the future that Jesus guaranteed for us. And in order to expect all of these things we have in life, to in order to expect the blessings, the eternal life, we must be able to trust, acknowledge, and commit to the Lord. Without that, we won't be able to obtain what we want, what we need, and to get further with the Lord. And as a youth, that may not be the easiest thing for me to do, but I am happy to have people around me to help me and to surround myself with people that will support me on this mission. And you definitely should do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for reminding us when we acknowledge our sin, we can trust in God with our future. The closing prayer will be done by Sian Lewis from Point Memorial CME Church in Wilmington, Delaware.
Patrick. I thank you for this day, and I pray that you help the people with the coronavirus, because they're all suffering. I also pray that you take care of the people who are up there in heaven because of it. I pray that you help the states that are suffering, and I pray and thank you, God, that you that you um, birthed us, and I and I thank you for taking care of us, and I hope that we can all power through this. In Jesus' name, amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. This is Bishop James B. Walker. I am the proudest bishop in the entire world today because our young people have really performed wondrously, amen, before the sight of the Lord. Uh, 7th Episcopal District, um, friends and brothers and sisters in Christ who have gathered all across the internet to be with us for this moment, I believe that we had an extraordinary time in Jesus Christ. I feel like one of those two disciples on the Emmaus Road. I feel that our hearts, amen, have burned within us as these young people talk to us along the way. Let me say to you, young people, you did a fantastic job. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody's name. Lamar, thank you. Phoenix, Anthony, Morgan, thank you. Daniel, Khalil, Ashley, Lauren, thank you. Your words set our hearts on fire today. This service was everything that we could have hoped for, and it was even more. Thank you to uh, Dr. Lowe, Dr. Deborah Lowe, as well as Reverend Sarita Collins, because you as our Christian educators, along with the parents of these anointed young people, have done this. You have not only educated and not only trained this present generation, but by working with them, you have assured us that there is an anointed generation that will follow them because teaching and training, amen, goes on down, amen, from the current generation to the one that follows it. I want to thank Reverend Ronald White as well as, well as Reverend Courtney Adams. Thank you, brothers, for your technical assistance. Thank you, presiding elders, uh, presiding elder AG, two districts, presiding elder Belcher, presiding elder Manis, presiding Elder Keys, and presiding Elder Harris. Thank you all for the wonderful job you have done. And all of those people who work behind the scenes, we praise the Lord for you. And now, let us bow our head in a moment of blessing. Father, we ask right now that the Lord would bless us and keep us, that the Lord would allow his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us, that the Lord God himself would lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace as we go forth on this good Friday evening. As we go forth, Lord, let your presence be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.